Dr. Barbara Hamilton is an interventional radiologist, physician leader, and mom who blogs at tiredsuperheroin.com. She is currently the chair of interventional radiology at Desert Regional Medical Center in Palm Springs, California. She went to med school at Rutgers, was a radiology resident at Brown, and did her IR fellowship at UCLA. Apparently, IR has a problem with PR. Different procedures they do, and for me and my family, that fact hits close to home. From TIPS procedures to fibroid embolization to treating vasculopathy, they have lots to offer our patients, and usually under conscious sedation. But just because they can doesn't mean they should, so we get into the evolving ethics of IR. Dr. Hamilton helps aspiring and early career doctors find work-life balance and financial empowerment through her writing, coaching, and speaking. Through a behind-the-scenes view, her audience gets to see her in the trenches, learning leadership skills and balancing a demanding job with family life. Ultimately, she strives to be an example of what is possible for her audience. She uses a mix of fear-busting, idea-sharing, and general cheerleading to provide her audience virtual support through their medical training so they can transition to full, multifaceted lives as attending physicians. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians. Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers. And now, here's Dr. Bradley Block. Dr. Barbara Hamilton, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me here. So if you have a med student rotating with you in interventional radiology, and you didn't know what field they were going into, so they could go into anything. Maybe they'd be next door, one of your referring doctors, or maybe they'd be something where they never end up referring to an interventional radiologist, right? They're just in a, in a specialty that's, that's far from it. What would you like them to take home about your specialty? What do you want them to know? That's a great question because our field doesn't get a lot of airtime in medical schools. And so some people never have any exposure. And to some people, they all they know is that we may do pick lines. So I would want them to know at its core, the basis of what we do is image guided procedures. And so sometimes that means that we overlap with the surgeons a bit. Over time, IRs have been able to figure out ways to get access and intervene in places that were previously just accessible with surgery. And this is advancing all the time, which is really exciting. So we use ultrasound, CT, we use live x-ray, also known as fluoroscopy, for image guidance. And with that, we use a very specialized tools, which allow us to drive around the body. Is there an outpatient, like is, is our interventional radiologist only in hospitals, or is there a role for outpatient? Does that even exist? Yeah, it does. That's a hot topic in IR right now is the uh, resurgence or I guess emergence of outpatient-based labs or OBLs for short. Um, So that's something that in our society we're talking a lot about and people are just striking out on their own. So for a long time, and still the majority of IRs are hospital-based, of course, you know, who actually employs them can vary and that varies based on state or locality. Um, But yeah, outpatient-based labs are becoming more and more popular as people delve into IR independent practices So there's a little bit of tension between diagnostic groups and interventional radiology in some places. And that's because of the RVU structure and just the pressures that have been placed. And so since IR is more of a clinical specialty and continues to become more and more of a clinical specialty and diagnostic radiology is not so clinical, um, there's just been some butting of heads in some groups and some places where IRs feel more compelled to strike out on their own to be able to practice in the way that they feel is appropriate. So rather than being, uh, say, a minority shareholder of a private group where they don't really get much say in what's going on, they're more being not directed by the diagnosticians, but you know what I'm saying? They, 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 because they're a minority vote, they don't get as much of a say in the direction that the practice takes. They'd rather not be beholden to the diagnostic radiologist, so they'd prefer to go out on their own. Yeah, sometimes there are, you know, it, it's for the entrepreneurial minded 
IR and it's for the IR who's maybe been in practice for a while and doesn't mind taking the risk. They feel confident in their, we were just talking before we got started about my episode on the Back Table podcast with Mary Constantino. Costantino, sorry, there's no N. And she is at an outpatient-based lab. She has a few years of experience under her belt, like 10-ish. So she has a very heavily fibroid embolization-based practice where she does fibroid embolizations and the women go home the same day. So she has no specific call. She's on call for her patients, but um, she just is able to control the patient experience and able to build the practice that she wants to do. Yeah, as you said, rather than being told by the diagnostic group and maybe they're, so for the diagnostic people, on the other hand, it can be like, you know, if you were doing a head CT instead of going to see that patient and follow up, you would have made a couple RVUs. But since you just went to see the patient at the bedside, it's like 0.2 RVUs. And that's not aligned with our goals as much. So, you know, there are some places where IRs feel like they can't practice the way they want to in a very clinical way because they're pressured to go back to the view box or, you know, the packs in between cases and just fire away the cases to try to prove their value where their value is really like practicing clinical IR. That's interesting. So you kind of go into the specialty, unless you know that you want to go into IR, you might've gone into the specialty thinking that you might not end up interacting with patients very often, or maybe not at all. And then you end up going into a specialty where, like you said, it's clinical. You're Mm -hmm. evaluating the patient independently and determining the procedure and determining how and getting consent and, you know, Mm -hmm. pre-op and all the, all the rest of it. Yeah, and forming that relationship. And I would say that is a misconception for radiologists in general, because a lot of the subspecialties within radiology are patient-facing to various degrees. So if you're a breast radiologist, you might spend 50% of your day actually talking to patients and you know, or like physically aspirating a cyst or doing a biopsy or doing, you know, checking an ultrasound in real time. And it's really just the like neuroradiology heavy is like an example off the top of my head, which is very, which is less patient facing. And maybe the only time you get up to see a patient is if the patient has a contrast reaction, or if you happen to be a neuro IR who also does like kyphoplasties or joint or facet injections. So it's all dependent on the individual, but it's also, I think, a misconception for radiology that we don't see, that most of us don't see patients. I think the opposite is actually true. So even diagnostic radiologists, they're getting up to do hip aspirations, hip injections, all of the arthrography. They're doing even fluoroscopy exams, like swallow studies. So we do see lots of patients. See, I would think that some of those that you listed as procedures would be the domain of the interventional radiologist. But you're saying that like, that the musculoskeletal radiologist is the one to do the knee aspirations and the... Um, well, the neuroradiologist might then become the neurointerventionalist. And so, so well, neuroendovascular so is totally separate because then you're getting into neuroendovascular. So that's, I'm sorry, it's so confusing, isn't it? And yes. no wonder there are these misconceptions. <laughs> <laughs> it's no so you wonder. have to become a radiologist, and then you can sort it all out. Yeah, but you need to do the four years of radiology residency, and not just the four. weekend course that that oh, my right. local pediatrician says. <laughs> yeah. I had someone actually say, oh, I wanted to I wanted to take a weekend course to learn how to do pediatric x-rays. I'm like, that's one of actually the most challenging exams. Like if you miss something, you have 22 years to be wrong. I mean, there's a lot riding on and people think it's simple sometimes when it's not. That, that's interesting. You know, we, we see that on social media a lot, right? You'll be on the Physician Side Gigs website and they'll say, Someone will ask, you know, I'm thinking about doing Botox and uh, filler injections. Does anyone know of a good weekend course? And someone smug will will write back, yeah, uh, yeah, I did it at my four-year dermatology residency program. You might want to consider doing something like that. So, yeah, yeah. There's, a lot, there's a lot of that out there. Actually, in, in ENT, I actually took a course in ultrasound, ultrasound of the neck, yeah. which which was was a weekend course. However, right, we're in the neck all the time. And it's actually very common in other parts of the world for the otolaryngologist to do their own ultrasounds. It's just for whatever reason in the United States, it's not as much a part of our training. But I just felt like for us, it's since we're in the neck all the time, it ended up just being 
more of an extension of the physical exam. It was. Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, there's the correlation for you is probably levels above what anybody else starting out just learning imaging would have. So you're coming to it with much more expertise of the anatomy and where things are. And then at that point, you're, yeah, I mean, we're laughing about a weekend course, but maybe that's what you need to like, you know, just get experience. And this is a normal lymph node. This is an abnormal lymph node. This is a, a Worthen's tumor. This is because yeah, a lot that. of times we're seeing that stuff and we, you know, we might get more, more invasive imaging. Turns out for those of you who are listening, who might be sending us patients, we did not buy the machine. It was too expensive. So <laughs> yeah. I continue to send it to my radiology colleagues for ultrasounds. Yeah, no, but it's very helpful for you to look at your own stuff, just like all the other, you know, just like the general surgeons do. Like they Absolutely. need to be able to look at their studies as well. And you know, kind of know what we're talking about. So back to the med student that was with you. Let's say, let's say this time it's not a med student. Mm -hmm. It's a, so it's a non-radiology resident that you know is going into a field that sends you a lot of patients, mm -hmm. right? You know, maybe it's an OB resident who's going to be sending you the, the fibroids. Maybe it's a GI resident who's going to be sending you GI bleeds. What do you want them to know uh, as as they're going to be sending you lots of patients. So how would you want them to maybe work the patient up prior to them seeing you? Uh, what are the patients that you want them to send you that maybe you want more to be either be sent sooner or more often, or maybe the patients that are being sent to you a lot that maybe don't necessarily need to be sent to you. Maybe they could be sent to someone else or the, you know, the specialist might be able to handle it on their own. So what, what is it that you want this resident to take away from your rotation? Yeah, I've been fortunate that over the course of my career, we've had residency programs actually get started within my hospital. So this does happen. Um, it's with internal medicine, uh, emergency medicine, and really, unfortunately, I mean, we just don't have OB residents. It's interesting that you use that as an example, because one of the populations that we, I feel like we're underutilized for is the fibroid population. And I feel like part of that was historically the, you know, the sense that women who desired fertility should undergo myomectomy first, but there's literature to prove that that's not necessarily the case. So what ends up happening for those fibroid patients is we just, we only get the ones who are morbidly obese or outright refuse any kind of surgical intervention. So I think those, I would love if people would send more fibroids or at least discuss it with their patients. And in some centers, they're doing like multidisciplinary clinics where the patient actually visits each consultant um, to talk about their different options so that all are kind of equitably presented. Because, I mean, it is far less invasive for a patient to undergo an embolization. And we know that it doesn't necessarily decrease their fertility. Interesting. So it's so which fibroid patients should you be seeing? Because it sounds like all of them. Well, I think that which they're problematic enough to consider a more invasive intervention. Mm -hmm. I think that it should be mentioned to every patient and not being in the room with all these OBGYNs. I can, and I'm friends with many of them, but I think in a lot of places, and it's just not the way that they're raised and they may feel, you know, they they grew up on the older literature that said, well, we're not sure whether, you know, there's some collaterals with the ovaries that you could be hitting and it could affect fertility. But there have been studies done since which show that that's not the case, that, you know, women can safely undergo embolization and it doesn't, you know, they have an equal pregnancy rate. That's interesting. And it really hits close to home because my wife had a fibroid removed before mm -hmm. We were, it was right before we were married, actually. And uh, I was supposed to be the one to drive her to the hospital, but I was on call until 7 a.m. that morning. Oh and at 6.45, I got called in for a post-tonsillectomy bleed. So oh. I wasn't able to be the one to take her to the hospital. Thankfully, her oh. parents were down. But she ended up having a, she had a fibro, she had a myomectomy. And because of the size of it, she, they wouldn't let her labor. So she had to have a C-section for all of our children. They had to be, uh, they had to be a planned C-section. And she really felt like something was taken from her, right? She didn't have the opportunity as a not enjoyable experience as that might be. You know, she she didn't have a choice. It was taken from her. And I was there for some of those doctor's visits and it was never brought up as a possibility. Mm, so maybe there was something about it that the OB considered it, thought about it, and decided that it wasn't a reasonable option, so it was never part of the conversation, or it yeah. was just something they weren't familiar with and not. And and the this was in 
Manhattan. So it's not like interventional radiology wasn't available to us. <laughs> no, it was not an access problem. Because yeah. <laughs> oh, that is something that is uh, near and dear to my heart and something that SIR, the Society of Interventional Radiology, is thinking a lot about these days. The people outside of Manhattan, the people outside of LA, their, ac- their ability to access an IR because we are becoming integral to the standard of care for a lot of disease processes. And so I think your point really drives it home. I don't know enough about your, your wife's fibroid to say anything about it, but I mean, it should be brought up. Yeah, I mean, it, it should have been, it should have been it part of the be conversation. Presented, even yeah. if to even if quickly dismiss it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. This like is something say, that's out hey, there. Yeah, this if you see this I don't on think the internet, it's yeah. or I mean, some people are even advertising on the radio because it's been such an access problem and it's just not part of the uh, care paradigm in some places that there's actually been direct to consumer marketing like, hey, do you have fibroids? Come uh, visit your local IR. Um, so people have gone to that length and started websites and just started like a basic, you know, direct to consumer marketing for this because um, it's been an access issue. I would imagine that something like Dr. Costantino's practice, where she really focuses on that, can go viral because, you know, these are these are issues where with social media, women mm-hmm. talk to each other, communicate with each other on social media. Yeah. And you have a good experience with something like this. Your friends communicate with you about you. it. And all of a sudden, you're telling, you know, you get a couple of evangelists that have a great experience and suddenly everybody everybody knows about it. Everybody knows about your practice. So aside from, from that pathology, are there any other pathologies that are like that, that you want to shout to the off the hilltops? I forgot <laughs> what that phrase is, but you know what I mean? That, that th- this is out there. This is something that we do. Send us these patients. Think of us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So peripheral artery disease is another big area where um, there are lots of patients in the community who need help with their peripheral arterial disease. And we're not seeing them, I'm not seeing them until very late. So they're presenting to the ER with like a gangrenous toe. Um, Of course, I see a lot of my patient population has a lot of diabetic patients. So that's a lot of small vessel disease. And sometimes we can't do as much for that, but I think everybody deserves um, when they have limb ischemia, they deserve to have, you know, an evaluation and potentially an angiogram to see if there's anything fixable there. So doesn't that overlap with vascular surgery? It does. And actually, um, some of my referral patterns are through vascular surgery. So just, uh, that being very local as well. Um, In some training programs, vascular surgeons are increasingly endovascularly trained, but at my center, it just so happens, I have a couple of surgeons about to retire. So while they do a little bit of endovascular, they they just like to send me the stuff that they feel is complicated or they don't have time to do today. And then I have a vascular surgeon colleague who's closer to my age, but she would rather be operating. So she would, she doesn't consider, I mean, you know, some patients might consider endovascular work operating, but, you know, she'd rather be sewing vessels and doing, you know, EVARs and bigger cases. So she sends me, you know, the runoff and see if you see what you can do. And so I'll take a crack at it. And whether it's one level we're working on, we're working on the pelvic inflow or we're working on the inflow and the outflow. I mean, there's, there's often nothing to lose with these patients. You know, they've, they're, they're just, they've been living with these, whether they're claudication symptoms or critical limb ischemia symptoms, they've just been kind of, I feel like they're falling through the cracks. And so I feel like there are a lot more patients that, that exist than we actually see. And I also have heard in our circles that, you know, there are just, you know, more patients than the number of specialists who could potentially treat them. Oh, there's too there's too much work out there. There is. We just need the patients to find us. Yeah. All right. Well, hopefully this podcast and our seven listeners will help to uh, <laughs> direct more patients to you. Okay. So so we've got your vasculopathy. We've got the fibroids. Anything else out there that you want us to start sending you more of now that we find out that you're already overwhelmed with work from too yeah, many Yeah. I mean, the, the work can come in you know, uh, it can be a deluge some days, but I often feel like what we can offer adds a lot to the the battery of options for a patient because the basis is minimally invasive procedures. So who could argue with that? So sometimes in in neuro endovascular, you know, the the question is, does the, let's let's use epistaxis as an example, mm -hmm. right? Because 
if we're going to take the patient to the operating room to try to stop their nosebleed, there's the concern. Uh, if it's a particularly sick individual, there's the concern for general anesthesia. So mm-hmm. we send them to IR. But mm-hmm. for neuro IR, those patients are, are going under general anesthesia. So the fact that, that it's thought of as minimally invasive in nature may not be advantageous in that situation because either way, the main risk in that specific situation is the general anesthesia. Is that ever the case for for non-neuro interventional radiology where you're thinking, oh, let's try IR because then they won't need anesthesia, but really, in fact, they do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for body intervention, it's a little bit different. So we do most cases under moderate sedation. So that means the patient has to be NPO for six hours, but we usually use a combination of Versed and fentanyl. Those are the cornerstones of moderate sedation. And so we can get through 90 plus percent of interventional radiology procedures with just moderate sedation. And so that's a huge um, benefit to the patients. There are some exceptions, like you mentioned. So neuro cases, I I don't do neuro intervention myself, um, not neurovascular anyway. I do things like kyphoplasty and transforaminal injections for pain, stuff like that. But for the neuro cases, I think that when they're doing them under general, it's because of uh, wanting to get the best image quality for the neurovasculature, which is so delicate and just having a perfect image because what you're, you know, whether you're fixing a, you know, doing a stroke thrombectomy or, you know, embolizing um, an angioma prior to resection, you know, it's more delicate, like you need the best images possible. Whereas in the body, it's like, well, sometimes my patient's fidgeting around a little bit and it's not going to, it's, it's not as big of a deal. Got it. Okay. Okay. The other exception for body intervention is a TIPS. So in a TIPS, you're doing a jugular access and then it, those procedures can be a little bit time consuming. So a quick TIPS is like 40 minutes, a prolonged TIPS could be hours. And then you're taking blind passes through the liver from the hepatic vein to the portal vein. And so that's just, uh, the patient might feel that. And I, I've even heard a horror story where <laughs> it's like a patient tries to sit up in the middle of that process. I mean, this is a very long needle. So you can oh. just imagine what would go wrong. (laughs) So those are the cases where we do general. And then one other case I'll say um, is when I'm doing microwave in the liver, like a microwave ablation, um, microwave can be painful, especially if it's near the capsule. Wait, sorry. I am completely unfamiliar with microwaving patients. Okay. (laughs) So just to add to the battery of things that we were talking about in IR, so local regional therapy for cancer is a cornerstone of IR. And so the examples of that would be like embolizing a tumor from the vasculature. So trying to cut off the blood supply by putting some microscopic beads, like microspheres in the, in the artery to cut off the blood supply or sometimes to for beta emitting radiation from particles. And then also ablation, which is so actually putting probes to either burn or freeze a tumor. And that can be done percutaneously, just like you would do a percutaneous biopsy under ultrasound or CT. So you just place these needles, which are then connected to a, a generator. And so in the case of cryoablation, which forms an ice ball, which you can monitor under CT, then that would be that would be with like argon gas. And then with microwave, we use a little probe. And so at the tip of the probe, you just position it strategically to cover the tumor and get a tumor margin. So it's like a percutaneous percutaneous way to basically take out, like a, do a metastectomy. Okay. So, but uh, when you say microwave, it's it's not, this is not radio frequency ablation because radio f- frequency is just, it's a fancy way of like, of saying a bovi. R- this is, microwave is different. It is different. Yes. Okay. So um, radio frequency ablation was the first kind of, the first way to percutaneously burn a tumor. Okay. And microwave has just come a long way in the last few years as far as the technology where it's, uh, and microwave is more powerful. So unfortunately, radio frequency, although it's safe, there are some uh, safety concerns like grounding pads that you need so that the patient doesn't have like skin burns. And then from the radio frequency waves going through the body. Yeah, it's and, an electric current. Exactly. And then there were size limitations for the tumor that you could treat. So if you had something, there there are papers showing that if a tumor size is greater than like two to three centimeters, then your local recurrence starts to go up. So Mm -hmm. that's what's great about microwaves. So if I have, it can be used for both primary or metastatic tumors. So say I have a patient with cirrhosis and a hepatocellular carcinoma. If I had a tumor that was greater than three centimeters, I'd really worry about recurrence with RFA. So what I could do is just place a single, single microwave probe 
right through the middle of the tumor. And then I could pick the watts and the time necessary to just burn the whole area, including a margin. Wow. Yeah, it's amazing, right? (laughs) You know, one of the reasons I I went into ENT is because we do a lot of different procedures and we do really slick, cool stuff. But I feel like I brought a knife (laughs) to a gunfight here. (laughs) No, no, not at all. (laughs) So is there there anything else? So, okay, so we've got metastatic tumors, fibroids, um, vasculopathy, anything else before we move on that you said make sure you consider IR before finishing your treatment plan. Put us somewhere in your treatment plan. Any other pathology that, that we should be considering interventional oh, radiology. Or, or, it's, <laughs> or, or rather, you feel like it's being under underrepresented. Like, you know, things that you've already get a ton of. You can, you can, otherwise, we'd, you know, we'd, be, we'd be doing this forever. So what are, what are some sure, sure. low-hanging fruit? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have different service lines like you alluded to. So there's venous disease. So we deal with people who have chronic venous insufficiency. We can open up veins, which have been kind of chronically scarred down or occluded. There's a number of women's health interventions, whether it's pelvic congestion disease syndrome, and we talked about fibroids. There's portal hypertension is a huge part of IR. So the cirrhotics and all the problems that comes come with cirrhosis. Um, so varices, we can do, we talked about tips for a, a moment. And then there's also a procedure which maybe not even some of the gastroenterologists know that we can do sometimes, which is a transvenous obliteration of varices. So sometimes if patients aren't good candidates for tips, they may actually have anatomy that's better for just going through the vein right into a gastrorenal shunt these are, and the, and they all have acronyms. So there's balloon assisted, coil assisted, and plug assisted transvenous obliteration, where you basically, you can burn and include isolated gastric varices. For, so for some patients, that's a better option, especially those at risk for encephalopathy. That's why, because of the breadth of what we do, I think that's why even for the subspecialties, the consultative part is so important because sometimes the consultation is somebody presenting the patient to me and saying, can you do anything? And, and that's the simple, that's the question. I, I, and, yeah. I, and I, and I, and I, I get that sometimes from the ER, like mm-hmm. they'll call me about a, a patient and, and I kind of recognize that the question being asked isn't like a specific thing. It's more like help, right? Yeah. Like, is there anything that you can do to help me to manage this patient? I don't have a specific consult question for you, but just help. And certainly that situation, you have to be you have to be you have to be sensitive to that, right? And recognize that that's the question that's being asked. So, so I, I I hear what you're saying. Exactly. Yeah. So, is there anything that you're getting consulted for that you think maybe can be worked up differently before they get sent to you, or maybe you're not the person asked because like, you because you mentioned pick lines. Some people think, oh, all IR does is pick lines. Do you even do you do pick lines? That's institution specific, but at my institution, I do maybe one or two a year. I I think the last one I did was because the patient requested that the physician do it. (laughs) And the nurses have a protocol, so they have to adhere to that but I really don't hear about them much. So, well, I, I, I am asked to do tunneled picks on we, you know, if a patient doesn't have any uh, peripheral veins, superficial veins for a pick to go into, um, then sometimes I'll be asked to do a tunneled pick, which is just less common. Yeah. Any, anything else out there that you think maybe guys, guys, I, you can, you should be able to, or you can manage that. I don't know how to say that in a sensitive way, but you know what I'm getting at. No, like the head smacking moments. Yeah. Yeah. There. <laughs> They are there. So one of them is getting called for emergent central lines and even emergent central like dialysis catheters and, you know, from the ER or the ICU. It's like, that's what the residents are there to learn. So they really, um, sometimes they'll send them to me if the INR is three and, you know, they're really afraid to puncture a certain patient at the bedside. Um, But a lot of, even the residents are doing ultrasound guided access to increase the safety of these procedures. So I think that's really important that they don't call me for those. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. They they need to know how to put in a central line. Mm -hmm. I remember doing that when I was an intern. And then once I was done with engineer, I was no longer putting in central lines. I was an ENT resident. Yeah. And I mean, the dialysis catheters, they're like big honking catheters. You certainly don't want to put those in the, in the carotid. So if there's any question, I'm happy to be a backup, but sometimes they don't think of it. 
Another thing that I feel like, you know, refers should keep in mind is we alluded to this with the fibroid thing, but SIR is working on health disparities. So certain groups in our population are really vulnerable to these health disparities. And there are places where IR can really come in and help. And it's just a matter of the patients being sent. So we talked about I mean, we really talked about this, but, you know, the fibroid patients there, this is a disease process that disproportionately affects African American women. And if, and that's also a population that's known to have some access issues to healthcare. And so we really need to make sure we bridge that gap. And as you said, I mean, sometimes social media can be so helpful to spread the word. And so um, SIR is working on those kinds of initiatives. We even gave a, gave a grant for residents to study the effect of hashtag fibroid embolization, something like that. So that may be a, a paper coming out in the next year or two. Another access issue is is peripheral artery disease. So that's another area where minorities are disproportionately affected. Like I work in a place where there's a huge Mexican population and they are very diabetes prone. So we have lots of diabetics. And so the number of vasculopaths in the community is just more than we could possibly treat. I'm actually surprised I'm not, you know, t- treating one after the other. And of course I'm doing, you know, dialysis work on all of them too. Is there, is there anything new and exciting going on in interventional radiology? And and by the way, what you just said, all the outreach that SIR is doing, I think is is new and exciting. But in terms of like, the, the technical procedures, right? Uh, what is what is at the forefront of interventional radiology? Yeah, we have some really exciting things happening in IR. So one of them is the prostate artery embolization is gaining traction for prostatomegaly and for patients who wish to not undergo surgery and they don't want the risk of all the potential complications of like a TERP and the like, the lasers, all the all the tools that the urologists have. You know, some patients don't respond well, and some patients don't want that risk. And so, fibroid or prostate artery embolization is gaining a lot of traction, and a lot of data is being generated. So that's really exciting coming down the line. Great. So I'm 40. So by the time my <laughs> prostate becomes a problem, it should be the standard of care. Yeah. No. By then, it'll be like LASIK for I sort. You know, it'll exactly. already be 20 years old <laughs> or. But, hopefully 30 or 40, but yeah. And anything else uh, coming down the pipe? Yeah, something that's relatively new, even though it was decided in 2012. So not just something that people outside of our sphere may not know is that the American Board of Medical Specialties actually approved IR as a primary specialty in medicine. So those who are plugged into the like academic and you know trainee kind of aspect of medicine, they may know this. There's a dedicated IR residency and there's a dedicated curriculum since 2012. So it's really exciting because it just it solidifies our position among surgery and internal medicine and all these other specialties that this is a legitimate specialty of its own, which has its own disciplines and therefore needs its own uh, special training program. You know, we we had some gaps in the old model, which I was trained in, um, where you may or may not get a ton of ICU exposure, but the patients on your table every day are ICU patients. So like, this is really helpful and this is going to lead to a really fantastic crop of new IRs as we continue to go through the next few years. It's really exciting. Oh yeah, and then you can control their intern year so they do get the ICU rotation, they get the emergency rotation, they get the general surgery rotation. They're able to really get uh, experience in the specialties that they're going to be interacting with the most. Yeah, and IR will become more integral to the whole residency experience because Four years of just diagnostic imaging, it's a long time. Of course, we image head to toe, so it's its necessary, but people who know that they want to go into IR will be able to kind of delve into that path sooner, and it'll be okay for them to go for an ICU month in the middle of radiology residency, which, where that didn't used to be part of the training. Or though they might go work with a vascular surgeon and do EVARS, you know, endovascular aortic repair for a few weeks. And that's just part of their radiology residency because now it's part of this new pathway. Yeah, I think there needs to be a lot more of that. As we're getting more compartmentalized in medicine, we know less and less about our what our colleagues do. But mm-hmm. at the same time, we need to know more and more about our specialty or our subspecialty. So it mm-hmm. makes sense for us to be more specifically trained given... The, the breadth of knowledge that we need to know, you know, like a th- should should a, a thoracic surgeon 
end up, you know, spending all this time doing, um, I don't know, appendectomies, right? Because yeah. in their future practice, that's not going to be something that they end up doing. I don't know. Maybe they do. Maybe this is a poor example. But you, you, you know what I mean? Like maybe it makes sense for us to be siloed sooner rather than later. In this, yeah, exactly. In, in no, it's a good fields. parallel to bring yeah. up that, you know, general, if you want to go into thoracic, you're doing a lot of general, a lot of years of general, and then you're doing a couple of concentrated years. And that, yeah, that like a breast really surgeon. Well. I mean, how much time does a breast, how many, how many uh, appendectomies does a breast surgeon need to do if, if their practice is going to be, I mean, they might be a general surgeon that does some breast, but again, it depends on what you're going to actually end up doing. Yeah. So it just, it looks really good for the future of our specialty. We're going to have IRs who know their disease processes that they're consulting with, you know, the specialist with inside and out. It's just, and we have some of the best and brightest who are applying. So the IR match was actually the most, by numbers, it was the most competitive in medicine wow. um, in the last couple of matches. So really us. so exciting. I know ENT is up there, but you beat us. <laughs> Well, if it's a competition, yeah. <laughs> Everything is a competition. Then, then yeah, we, I think we did that here. <laughs> okay, so is there anything else that you think bears mentioning before we, uh, before we wrap, wrap up the podcast? Either head smack moments or more stuff that you want to see in your, uh, in your consultations? Sure. So I think as people come through training, they may run into some older ideas about IR because that's just, it, it's such a rapidly changing field. So I want people to know that IR is a very evolving specialty. It's really exciting to see all the new devices and treatments that are constantly being invented and honed every year. It's allowing us to treat a greater number of patients and the advances are really stunning to watch. Um, and it's a huge privilege and it's just a privilege as an IR to be able to share this on a case by case basis with my colleagues. And then I think the other huge aspect of our future is cost effectiveness. So I think IRs, often are able to provide really cost-effective treatments. One example of that would be doing ports in IR under moderate sedation instead of in the operating room with general anesthesia. So I would love, uh, going back to that, you know, for people to send ports in droves to IR because we do a good job. And I mean, it's quick. The patient is just sedated. They feel some pushing and then they're out. Um, and cost effectiveness is really important for all of us. Absolutely, especially since we're all going to be on uh, Medicare. And then I guess Medicare yeah, the other all. exciting thing kidding, I wanted really. to mention that dovetails with that is um, we're in within the SIR because I've been involved with SIR and percolated into some leadership positions. That's why I mention it. Is there some really great things that I've been able to see getting started? And one of them is there's going to be a new initiative for ethics in IR. And part of that stems out of the fact that, unfortunately, we do see the patients that nobody else wants to touch, the patients that are not fit for anesthesia. And so sometimes those patients are like 96 years old and they like maybe they're headed for hospice, but nobody can bite the bullet and get the family to agree to hospice. So ethics in IR are really important for us. I mean, I have GI bleed patients. It's like the patient's been drinking themselves to death um, now they're 40, but they're, you know, they're, it's their final day. And I have the opportunity to try to come in like the hero at the last moment, but it's like, they literally can't, they have no ability to clot anymore around my coils. And there is just nothing we can do. And we're just throwing thousands of dollars of coils down into this, trying to plug the drain. So I think, you know, ethics in IR are something that is something good, that's going to be really interesting to watch develop. And it's something that we all talk about, but we haven't really developed like in our culture, in our literature. And this is something that we're going to be bringing in. So I'm really excited to see that. And it's, a, I think it's a huge cultural discussion that we all need to have. I think it's a huge deficit in our American system that we don't allow anybody to gracefully pass. We don't allow anyone to rest at the end. 
we do everything till the last moment. Oh yeah, well during during the Obama administration as part of the Affordable Care Act, <sighs> they introduced a CPT code so that if a primary care physician wanted to bill for having a conversation about end of life care, right? Patient comes in for let's say bronchitis and you put them on whatever you're going to put them on mm -hmm. and you notice that the patient is also you know, sick, maybe they have metastatic cancer, maybe for whatever reason you think it's appropriate to have this conversation for end of life care, maybe they're young and healthy and you just think it's appropriate for all, for all your patients to have things set up, which is totally appropriate. Yeah. So that's going to take you extra time in your visit. Let's give the primary care physicians a CPT code so they can bill for it. So is there oh man, one? and that was the death panels. That oh. <laughs> was turned by the opposition into... And they're going to have these death panels that if you're over X age, then you're not going to get any medical care. So they just spun that in the other direction. So there are attempts being made to facilitate having these conversations so our primary care physicians can actually bill for it. And yet, politically, that was turned on its head and, and used against that, that administration. They, they should so. be able to bill for it. And that's yes. probably one of their most important roles. Critical and for you. saving all of us money and allowing all of us to have a uh, or some of us to have a you know a civil passing yeah i mean if i had a drum right now i'd be beating it yeah <laughs> this is so i to 100% agree with you yeah. there was a really there was a great little spot it might have been 2020 about a town in the midwest somewhere where one of the doctors had taken it upon himself to instill this in the local culture and it was a place where locally they had like you know, a very high percentage of the population had an advanced directive and they didn't need to be 80 to have it. They all had it. Yeah. And it's because this of uh, this one doctor's work and it's so amazing. I mean, but what an uphill battle. I mean, yeah, it's like- Right, it's a fight and, and, and there's no way to get paid for it. And yet you're saving- tons of money for the system and allowing us to 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 pass in a in a reason in a more reasonable way than we're really doing right now. Yeah, I mean so, sometimes what I'm doing is giving the patient maybe 24 more hours to yeah. to try. Maybe their family has a little more time to say goodbye and I feel like that is worthwhile and I do what I'm asked to do. Um but sometimes it does go into dicey ethical waters and I think yeah, it's just great that we're going to be talking about this more and writing about it and maybe, you know, IR is an innovative field. Maybe we can help lead the way in some of these discussions about end-of-life care. Well, this is not all you're doing and not all you're talking about. So tell us about tiredsuperheroin.com. Oh, I'd love to. So I am uh, in a male-dominated specialty and I have taken it upon myself in my free time to try to change that single-handedly. And I write a blog so I can show um, women who are considering male-dominated fields like my own, interventional radiology and surgery, so they can see what work-life balance and also financial empowerment look like in these fields. So just one example, I'm putting myself out there to write about the things I've learned. I'm six years into my career and I've negotiated for myself several times. So I'm writing about early career development, leadership development, and I also took personal finance on as a as a side hobby. So I write about that as well because I just feel that women in medicine need to be empowered as much as possible. I think when women are paid what they're worth, good good things happen. And I just see, I saw a lot of women being turned away from my field and others like it for the wrong reasons. And that is actually going to be a another episode. So we're going to have you on the show later on, and we're going to talk about that being a being a female in a male-dominated field and how to contend with that. So Dr. Barbara Hamilton, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. It has been a pleasure. Yeah, likewise. Thank you so much. I'm excited for our next chat too. That was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. He can be found at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a question for a previous guest or have an idea for a future episode, send a comment on the webpage. Also, please be sure to leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next time on the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.